But I think it is worth spending some time on the life and career of Joe Biden because basically his career in American politics is uniquely awful in almost every way. And uh, to, to start, to prepare for this, I, I went back to, to one of my Bibles, one of these tomes that I uh, you know, thumb through from time to time when I'm feeling down. I need to connect with some of the wisdom of people who have come before me. I'm speaking, of course, about uh, Alexander Coburn's A Colossal Wreck, A Road Trip Through Political Scandal, Corruption, and American Culture. And I knew Alex would have some good words about Joe Biden. And I'd like to start by doing a very rare anti-reading series. By anti-reading series, I mean I'm going to read you something that's actually good. This was written in that's August weird, dude. 23rd, 2008, around the time Joe Biden became Obama's running mate. Change and hope are not words one associates with Senator Joe Biden. A man so ripely symbolic of everything that is unchanging and hopeless about our political system that a computer simulation of the corporate political paradigm senator in Congress would turn out Biden in a nanosecond. The first duty of any senator from Delaware is to do the bidding of the banks and the large corporations that use the tiny state as a drop box and legal sanctuary. Biden has never failed his masters in his primary task. Find any bill that sticks it to the ordinary folk on behalf of the money power, and you'll likely detect Biden's hand at work. The Bankruptcy Act of 2005 was just one example. In concert with his fellow corporate serf, Senator Tom Carper, Biden blocked all efforts to hinder bankrupt corporations from fleeing their real locations to the legal sanctuary of Delaware. Since Obama is himself a corporate serf, and from day one in the U.S. Senate has been attentive to the same masters that employ Biden, the ticket is well-balanced. The seesaw with Obama at one end and Biden at the other dead level on the fulcrum of the corporate capital. Another shining moment in Biden's progress in the current presidential term was his conduct in the hearings on Judge Alito's nomination to the U.S. Supreme Court. From the opening moments of the Judiciary Committee's session in January 2006, it became clear that Alito faced no serious opposition. On that first ludicrous morning, Senator Pat Leahy sank his head into his hands, shaking it in unbelieving despair as Biden blathered out a self-serving and inane monologue lasting a full 20 minutes before he even asked Alito one question. In his allotted half hour, Biden managed to pose only five questions, all of them ineptly phrased. He did pose two questions about Alito's membership of a racist society at Princeton, but had already undercut them in his monologue by calling Alito a man of integrity, not <laughs> once but twice, and further trivialized the interrogation by reaching under the dais to pull out a Princeton cap and put it on. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> a Delaware newspaper made deadly fun of him for his awful performance, eliciting the revealing confession from Biden that... I made a mistake. I should have gone straight to my question. I was trying to put him at ease. <laughs> Biden is a notorious flapjaw. His vanity deludes him into believing that every word that drops from his mouth is minted in the golden currency of Pericles. Vanity is the most conspicuous characteristic of U.S. senators en bloc, nourished by deferential acolytes and often expressed in loudest sexual advances to staffers, interns, and the like. Why did Obama choose Biden? One important constituency for Biden was no doubt the Israel lobby inside the Democratic Party. Obama, no matter how fervent his proclamations of support for Israel, has always been viewed with some suspicion by the lobby. Wonder why. <laughs> for, for half the lifespan of the state of Israel, Biden has been its unswerving acolyte in the U.S. Senate. That was Alexander Coburn writing on August 23rd, 2008 God. about Senator Joe me. Biden. You know what's the freakiest thing about Biden? Genuine, unnerving, weird thing about him that makes me... Th makes him feel like a lot of these guys just like you're a lizard man he always bragged about the fact that he's one of the poorest senators right like he never had a lot of money he's got like a six-figure net worth they, they made a lot of that in 2008 what a fucking loser uh, well that's what i'm saying it's like he was an absolute crook and and corporate bag man for all the insurance companies and credit card companies that run delaware and he didn't even get any fucking he didn't get a boat out of it or anything yeah. what kind of freak it's like, yes, I will be your pathetic. I will be your Renfield in the Senate. And no, no, thanks. Uh, just, your, your, uh, your gratitude is all I need. To be fair, though, uh, your money goes really far in Delaware. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Do you know? I just, I just want to ride the train. I don't need a boat. <laughs> Do you know how much like a crooked Cook County? Uh, yeah. alderman makes <laughs> like they're just caked up but that's michael like, mad michael madigan is just sh fucking dumping out stacks uh, and <laughs> but because this is biden yeah. it's the it's the power 
And it's the yeah. it's the press. That's what he yeah. he doesn't give a shit. He, he's a he should have been. It's yeah. actually more disturbing than yeah. someone that's just purely corrupt. He, he should have been a YouTuber. He should have been. He has the personality of a Jake Paul. He that has is the same true. shit he personality. Shut the fuck up. But I love that Alito thing is great. Don't you hate it when you try to play good cop, bad cop, and you, you're like, oh, I just did good cop, good cop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind idiot. of astounded they fucking left him on the Judiciary Committee after they need a Hill fucking hearing. Uh, are you, are you shocked, shameful. though? shameful. No, I'm it, not. But it's a, Democrats. It's, it's breathtaking how badly he fucked let's, that well, up. Let's go over that. His role in the ju- Judiciary Committee. He did... Uh, he was instrumental in stopping Bork from getting on the Supreme Court. Yeah. But th- I mean, let's be honest, that was kind of a layup. You just look at that guy's weird flesh beard and yeah. you're just like, <laughs> no. However, his performance during the Clarence Thomas hearings are world historically awful. And probably the most important thing he did as head of that committee at the time, mm-hmm. controlled by fucking yep. Democrats, was not allow any of the other accusers that Anita Hill, and there was at least two yeah. others who were willing to testify Astounding. about Clarence Thomas, Astounding. would not let them. And then his exam- his, his question, his ex- cross-examination of Anita Hill was also horrible. Yeah. Uh, was, yeah. Definitely like... Very like, hostile. Treated her as a hostile witness, yeah. for sure. Uh, yeah, Clarence Thomas will be on the Supreme Court for another 30 years, thanks to Joe Biden. Uh, let's talk a little and bit. Nanobots. Uh, let's talk a little bit. Uh, we, we talk about he is a consummate bagman for the banking industry and being from the state of Delaware. Uh, he voted for something called the Regal Neal Banking Efficiency Act oh, in 1994, good. which allowed commercial banks to do business over state lines. And then he also voted for the Graham Leach Biley Act, Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999, which famously overturned Glass Steagall, which separated commercial from investment banking. That worked out well. So 2008 economic crash, uh, you can, he had his hands in that as well. Uh, probably more famous, if you're familiar with Biden now, because he's taking more heat for it, he should be taking a lot of heat for uh, the bank bailout in 2008, as well as all of these you know, financial modernization acts as well. But he is taking a little heat now because of his history um, with the crime bills and being a, a, Ooh, yeah. a, a, like being bad cop, finally being bad cop, but basically just to America's swollen underclass yeah. of, you know, people who sold like a dime bag of crack and got 30 years fucking time. Guys, I remember to do it, but at the wrong time, he's the father of the crack, uh, powder cocaine disparity, sentencing disparity. Yeah. He, uh, it was, um, everyone was so excited about it too. Uh, the Heritage Foundation, for example, gave him a ringing endorsement mm-hmm. for his role in the Grand Bill. Uh, this is this is now uh, from a Jacobin article oh, by Bronco, yeah. Bronco Marcetic. One episode in particular sums up Biden's record. In September 1989, George H.W. Bush delivered a speech outlining his national drug control strategy in which he called for harsher punishments for drug dealers, nearly $1.5 billion towards drug-related law enforcement, and more prisons, more jails, more courts, more prosecutors at every level throughout the country. At the time, the Heritage Foundation gushed that it constituted the largest increase in resources for law enforcement in the nation's history, and it's now remembered as a key moment in the escalation of the war on drugs. For Biden, however, it was a half measure. Quite frankly, the president's plan is not tough enough, bold enough, or imaginative enough to meet the crisis at hand, Biden said in a televised response to Bush's speech. In a nutshell, the president's plan does not include enough police officers to catch the violent thugs, enough prosecutors to convict them, enough judges to sentence them, or enough prison cells to put them away for a long time. It's not creative? It's not imaginative enough? Where are the trebuchets to launch them into brick walls? (laughs) Where are where are the giant human sized uh, uh, mouse traps where you put crack in the middle and then they slap into their spines? Listen to this. Biden was already a tough on crime evangelist before this speech. Of course, in the 1980s, Biden worked with his quote old buddy arch segregationist Throm, Strom Thurmond to pass several bills that fundamentally reshaped the American criminal justice system justice system in the direction of more incarceration. They, along with Ted Kennedy, had worked on earlier unsuccessful proposals that raised maximum penalties, removed a directive requiring the U.S. Sentencing Commission to take into account prison capacity, and created the cabinet-level drug czar position. In 1984, they passed the Comprehensive Crime Control Act, which, among other things, abolished parole, imposed a less generous cap on good-time sentence reductions, and allowed the Sentencing Commission to issue more punitive guidelines. Uh, Just following up that little hyperlink about his good buddy, Strom Thurmond, I came across this anecdote. Joe Biden delivered Strom Thurmond's eulogy at Strom's (laughs) own request. Saying of it, he says, some of you knew my relationship with Strom. 
Did I ever think when I got here I would become friends with Strom Thurmond? He stood for everything, everything I got started because of civil rights. Yet, on his 100th birthday, again, evil people never God fucking damn die. It. It's just Yet, on his 100th awful. birthday, shortly thereafter, on his deathbed, I got a phone call from his wife, Nancy. She said, I'm standing here at the nurse's station, Joe, with the doctor. Just left Strom. He keeps eyeing the nurse. He asked me to call you. He wants a favor. I said, of course, Nancy, whatever he wants. He said he'd like you to do his eulogy. Well, I never thought, never in my wildest dreams, that this place, these walls, the honor that resides, would put me in a position where a man whose career was one of the most interesting in modern American (laughs) history asked me to be his eulogist? By the way, he says that his career started in civil rights. That's kind of true. One of his big issues when he ran for Senate in the 1970s was opposing busing. So he is correct that that civil rights did, uh, in a way... Uh, that was get the him into topic politics. that he, yeah. I want to return now to um, Mr. Coburn again, because wouldn't you know it, he has written quite a few wonderful paragraphs about Mr. Biden. And this will uh, bring us back once again to the issue of the Israel lobby. Alexander Coburn uh, writing in July 10th, 2009, after he's become vice president, writes, appropriately, it was on the topic of Israel as vice president, Biden first tossed aside unmanly prudence. <laughs> Even given the zeal of almost every member of the U.S. Congress to satisfy the Israel lobby, Biden has always been conspicuous for his slavish posture towards the holy state. Accepting Obama's offer of the vice presidential nomination last summer, he announced emphatically that he would not have considered accepting the invitation if he had entertained the slightest suspicion that Obama was not 100% in Israel's corner. In fact, the Israel lobby did entertain these unworthy suspicions, which is why it pushed strongly for Biden as Veep. It wasn't far into Obama's first months in the White House that the lobby began to feel that even though Obama's chief of staff is Rahm Emanuel, their suspicions were justified. The president dared to mention in public the plight of the right of Palestinians to some form of state. He said that the settlements on the West Bank had to stop. True, he didn't say anything categorical about the actually existing illegal settlements. He seemed too eager to parlay with Iran, too demure on the topic of its nuclear program. On July 5th, George Stephanopoulos interviewed Biden in Baghdad for his Sunday morning talk show on the ABC network and promptly put the question, if the Israelis decide Iran is an existential threat and they have to take out the nuclear program militarily, the United States will not stand in the way? Biden lunged for the driver's wheel and swerved U.S. government policy in a whole new direction. We cannot dictate to another sovereign nation what they can and cannot do when they make a determination. If they make a determination, they're existentially threatened and their survival is threatened by another country. The White House spent the next two days categorically denying that it was giving via Biden Israel the go-ahead to make a unilateral attack on Iran. The United States is absolutely not flashing Israel a green light to attack Iran, U.S. President Barack Obama told CNN in Moscow on July 7th. Then, in the same Stephanopoulos interview, Biden sucker-punched Obama again, addressing the failure of Obama's stimulus program to halt the surge in unemployment and prompt recovery, a failure failure that has the president tumbling in the polls. In devising this program, Biden confided to Stephanopoulos, the Obama administration had misread the extent of the economic catastrophe it inherited. The truth is, we and everyone else misread the economy. The figures we worked off in, of in January were the consensus figures and most of the blue chip indexes out there. So Oops. once again, back to uh, Biden and his uh, wonderful views on foreign policy and on uh, banking. Uh, you know, the onion, remember? Yeah. He's mm-hmm. like cool grandpa. He's like washing a Trans Am in the... In front of the White House, that's adorable. Yeah, dude, and he's just so dude. When him and Obama would get out there, and they would just like Obama would be like the he'd be the straight man because he was adulting like a boss. But then Biden would be like, "Yo, I'm like a fucking line break joke from Weird Twitter. Check me out. <laughs> Pretty good." I do have a soft spot. I have to confess to for Joe Biden because, like me, he overuses the word literally, and uh, so I feel also like kinship. a YouTuber. Yeah, I have a feel a kinship to him on that. I mean, Matt, you you hate YouTube, but like all the all of them being centralized there, Jake and Logan Paul, everyone else in Team Ten, Shane Dawson, that's they can just do that for the rest of their lives and not become shitty center right politicians. That's true. That's until true. Logan Paul becomes president of the neo American Imperium. Well, I've been years. in Logan Paul's ear. 
I attempt to become the Rasputin of Team 10. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you luck. Sorry, one last quote from Coburn here. He says, no one thinks Biden is running the country, and maybe this is the core of Obama's Biden problem. Almost all politicians are narcissists, and Biden, more than most, is narcissistically vulnerable. It's why he so often got into trouble for lying about his achievements. It's why, as a senator, he couldn't stop talking. Yeah, and then uh, he got so buffaloed by Obama as his friend that he allowed him to talk him out of running for president in 2016 when he probably could have beaten Hillary and definitely would have beaten Trump, which is what his pitch is now for 2020 is we can just do 2016 all over again mm -hmm. and that it, it'll be exactly the same. And then those 70,000 white people in the Midwest who flipped and, and led to, Trump's election they would vote for me and he's right that that probably would have happened in 2016 but you know things are different now the yeah but how is fun is it going to be to watch him figure out during a debate or a speech that his window has closed it's going to be funny because oh, yeah. it's pretty clear that like like there's no appetite for I mean when he no. goes out no there one's and says, thirsting for bite yeah when these goes out there and says millennials are a bunch of pussies and should stop whining so much I mean what the food is that even for? Yeah. I mean, even like, even well, even well the, Amy Klobuchar. Yeah, <laughs> he's no last dragon. No, yeah. he can't even fucking touch Amy Two Targaryen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean that that's just a small sample of his career. But if you could just go through it again, um, slavishly devoted to uh, Israel and anything they do. They want to launch a preemptive nuclear strike on Iran. He says, go for it. Live your truth. He, he uh, big, big supporter of the Iraq war initially before then, of course, becoming a critic and saying, oh, it was incompetently executed. Of course. Mm -hmm. of course. Uh, bank deregulation oh, and just time. generally being a courtesan to the credit card industry and every other corrupt uh, corporation that has a mailbox in Delaware that allows them to evade taxation or regulation. Yeah. Um, uh, insane tough on crime in psychotic shit. prison sentences for tiny amounts of drugs yeah. th violent thugs super predators I mean honestly he's ma he makes Kamala look almost good in that regard I mean she I mean I, then again she was in the front lines carrying yeah, out she this was policy. actually throwing them in jail using yeah. the laws that he'd passed she was so there you go who's the worse lines. they're working together that's the it's the army you know okay and let's start with Joseph P. Biden Rob R. R. No, Joseph P. Biden. Okay. Just like Joseph P. Kennedy. I don't know. I'm making I'm making it up, folks. It's Robinette. Robinette. His How do you middle know? name you, is you Robinette. You can't make a funnier joke than his real middle name. Joseph yeah. Joseph Robin, like the pop star Biden. Yeah. That's what he's named after. Okay. Now here's the thing about Joe Biden. He's cool. I, I think I think a case can be made that his brain is almost as gelatinous as Donald Trump's is at this point. Yeah. No. Absolutely. He is his, like he's clearly. Try on riddled. There's he's no rambling, just putting head in answers to shit. Like he's doing almost no public events. He's only speaking in front of, you know, the fucking, you know, millionaires club in New York or whatever. Yeah. But I, I think we should start there. And I want I want to begin now with uh, some comments he made at the uh, the New York uh, Billionaires Society. This is um, uh, from Bloomberg by Jennifer Epstein. Biden tells elite donors he doesn't want to, quote, demonize the rich. I mean, why would you demonize like actual demons. Nah, if you call a demon by its name, it's, you know, they lose their power. Yeah. They spin around in a circle and zip back into hell. You can't have that. So let's let's hear what former Vice President Joe Biden had to say to Baphomet and um, various others at the New York's Carlisle Hotel. So it says here, he told the affluent donors Tuesday that he wanted their support, perhaps unlike some other Democratic presidential candidates, won't be making them political targets because of their wealth. Quote, remember, I got in trouble with some people on my team on the Democratic side because I said, you know, what I've found is rich people are just as patriotic as poor people. Not a joke. I mean, we may not want to demonize anyone who's made money, Biden told about 100 well-dressed donors at the Carlisle Hotel on New York's Upper East Side, where the hors d'oeuvres included lobster, chicken sante, and crudités. I always like when they give you a little flavor about what the spread is like yeah. in events like this. I, that is honestly all I actually care about, so oh, I'm yeah. glad they tell me. Like you know, a snack. A lobster, that seems like, but like you know, crudite, that's like the most basic. Well, why do you end that's with... That's just yeah. a word for vegetables, yeah, right? Yeah, if you're going to list three, why would you end with crudite? I like lobster, chicken satay, good, but like crudite, come you, on. Where's, where's, where's that little, like the, 
the the wagyu beef wagyu on the beef slider crackers, wagyu beef slider mm-hmm. or no just like the roast beef on those little crackers a little horseradish Ooh, uh, yeah. dressing yeah little, mm-hmm. pop those in mm-hmm. 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 maybe some tuna you know some some like you gotta that. have some sort of hamachi some sort of, yes exactly mm-hmm. or or uh, yeah but whatever these carpaccio people carpaccio much but come on these mm-hmm. come on these people may be rich but they're fucking pigs they're cheapskates they got yeah. no, they well, have no that, class no, that, that's the thing the is, is on the, horseback, the, the whole thing where... about uh, about political uh, dinners is the joke is like you're paying 10 grand for a plate and it's just they call it the rubber chicken circuit for a reason they skimp on the actual food you're just there to you know make a deal for your fucking oil pipeline or child zoo or whatever <laughs> you're trying to get built so he goes truth of the matter is you all know you all know in your gut what has to be done biden said I, I oh, said, okay. what, like, what, what do these people in this audience know in their gut has to <laughs> yeah, be done? Seriously. That is a terrifying thought. Yeah. I, I do like, however, that Biden is clearly not listening to his steam team and going totally off script. And he's going to do that this entire time. And I really look forward to it. Well, we're going we're gonna to get to him going off script. This, in is, another this is liquor before beer Biden. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like he's every time he's run for president before he's eaten complete shit. <laughs> well, he goes on to say. We can disagree in the margins, but the truth of the matter is it's all within our wheelhouse and nobody has to be punished. No one's standard of living would change. Nothing would fundamentally change, he said. Read that again. Nothing would fundamentally change. This is, I guess, I mean, this, I guess, sums up both the appeal and the um, horror of Joe Biden potentially being uh, the Democratic nominee. Yeah. Just no one is at smooth fault. sailing because what could possibly happen? You know what I mean? Like, I, I, like it's insane to me that this would be your message in 2020. Yeah, but like at the same time, like you, you know, I, it's hard for me to like you know gainsay like what the him just saying. Nobody's to blame. There are no enemies. Nothing will fundamentally change other than Donald Trump won't be president anymore. And I got to say, that may be a very attractive message to a lot of people. Out yeah, there. I fucking hope not. But I think if he said back to normal, which is what he meant to say. He could reel in some people, but nothing will change implies that at this very moment, we are going to continue indefinitely. Well, listen, it says former Clinton... Return to normalcy. It was good enough for Warren G. Harding. Former Clinton Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin and former Deputy Treasury Secretary Roger Altman uh, were among the attendees at the event. Invoking Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders' goal of a political, quote, revolution... Biden suggested that he would be the antidote by making marginal changes that would improve the lives of working and middle class Americans without slapping onerous taxes on the rich. When you have income inequality as large as we have in the United States today, it brews and ferments political discord and basic revolution, he said. Oh, he's up on that brewing and fermentation. <laughs> he's having an IPA. <laughs> Uh, also, perhaps hinting at President Donald Trump, he continued, it allows demagogues to step in and blame what's wrong in voters' lives on the other. See, the thing is, it says this is hinting at Donald Trump. He's also hinting at Bernie Sanders. Of course, yes. Because when he said, you're not the other, (laughs) Biden told the assembled group, which included former Treasury Secretary Robert fucking (laughs) Rubin, one of five people on earth probably most individually responsible for the financial crash that 80% of this country has still not actually recovered from. Mm -hmm. You're not the other, Biden told the assembled group, most of whom were wearing suits. I need you very badly. I need Damn. you. I Biden lo- says to nation's billionaires, you up? <laughs> <laughs> Biden has the Drake horny watch, and he's like, I long for your nipple in my mouth. <laughs> Congratulations to the Toronto Those Raptors, billionaire pussies be popping. Uh, okay, so like you, 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 I read you that, like how it was quoted in Bloomberg, though. But I want to read just the unedited comments of the, this is just like, this is unedited. Like this is Joe Biden's closing statement at this like you know huge fundraising dinner, fundraising dinner at the Carlisle on the Upper East Side. Just listen to this and try to tell me his brain is not working with Trump level powers. <laughs> By the way, you know, remember I got in trouble with some of the people on my team on the Democratic side because I said, you know what I found is rich people are just as patriotic as poor people. Not a joke. I mean, we may not want to demonize anybody who has made money. The truth of the matter is, you all, you all know, you all know in your gut what has to be done. We can disagree in the margins, but the truth of the matter is, it's within all our wheelhouse and nobody has to be punished. No one's standard of living will change. Nothing would fundamentally change. because No one's standard of living would change. <laughs> because when... Hey, yeah, yeah, people, yeah, 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 tough yeah, luck. Yeah, yeah. No Maybe one. next century. If you're down there, you're staying down there. If you're up there, you're staying up there. Because... When we have income equality as large as we have in the United States today, it brews and ferments political discord and basic revolution. Not a joke. Not a joke. 
I'm not inaudible revolution, but not, a, but not a joke. It allows demagogues to step in and say the reason where we are is because of the other, the other. You're not the other. I need you very badly. I hope if I win the nomination, I won't let you down. I promise you. I have a bad reputation. I always say what I mean. The problem is sometimes I say all that I mean. All right. Um, another thing he, uh, he mentioned that's uh, pure Joe Biden and I'm you know, sure should play well. Joseph R. Biden Jr. defending himself on Tuesday night against suggest this is from the New York Times um, on Tuesday night against suggestions that he is quote too old fashioned for today's Democratic Party invoked two Southern segregationist senators <laughs> by name as he fondly recalled the civility of the Senate in the 1970s That's and the 80s. Biden touch. Speaking at a fundraiser at the Carlisle Hotel, Mr. Biden, 76, stressed the need to be able to reach consensus under our system and cast his decades in the Senate as a time of relative comedy. His remarks come as some in the party say that Mr. Biden is too focused on overtures to the right as he seeks the Democratic presidential nomination. At the event, Mr. Biden noted that he served with the late Senators James O. Eastland of Mississippi and Herman Talmadge of Georgia, both Democrats who were staunch opponents of desegregation. Mr. Eastland was the powerful chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee when Mr. Biden entered the chamber in 1973. Entered the 36th chamber. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a caucus with James O. Eastland, Mr. Biden said, slipping briefly into a Southern accent. <laughs> According to a <laughs> he's like sipping a sarsaparilla. <laughs> uh, I do declare. Where, wait a minute. He, he went off stage to put on a seersucker suit. What's <laughs> happening here? He's fanning himself with a Panama hat. <laughs> this Biden is wilted. <laughs> According to a pool report from the fundraiser, he said, quote, he never called me boy. He always called me son. <laughs> Does he know who they call uh, boy? Yeah. Does he know what that is referring to? Yeah. He's a white man. That wouldn't be in the I cards. I don't know. Yeah. You know uh, what? He doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> uh, I, I looked this up, and the guy, James O. Eastland, there are some unbelievable <laughs> quotes from this guy about, you know, uh, I can't even read it on the yeah. show, but I'll just say they include the phrases inferior race. <laughs> Uh, the right of any white man to uh, kill by gun, bow and arrow, rock, or, or knife um, anyone who threatens white supremacy. So, bow and arrow? Yeah. 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 We, he would be canceled nowadays, to say the least. Yeah. He called Mr. Talmadge one of the meanest guys I ever knew. You know, go down all the list of these guys. Well, guess what, Mr. Biden continued. At least there was some civility. We got <laughs> things done. We didn't what agree. Things? We didn't agree. Please name a thing that you got done with the psycho segregationists. We didn't agree on much of anything. We got things done. We got it finished. I guess he means segregation, but certainly we not. We got it finished. <laughs> he goes, but today you look at the other side, and you're the enemy, not the opposition. The enemy. We don't talk to each other anymore. <laughs> and then uh, th this just just cool. just came in, um, just like right before I got here. And it says here, this is from CNN, Biden had been previously warned by advisors not to use Eastland as an example of someone he could work with. He's despite, going off script. He shoots from the hip. <laughs> despite many sharp disagreements, two, two people familiar with the matter said Wednesday, he needs to use a new, less problematic example. One person close to Biden told CNN. He also has to accept when everyone tells him that no one is burning toasts. <laughs> we don't know what he's talking about. There's no one burning toast around him. So like, here's the thing about Biden. It just seems to me like he, like he said, it's just going to Joe being Joe the whole time. And he knows that he has the support of basically all of the upper echelons of the Democratic Party apparatus. You know, he's their guy. He's promising what they want to hear to the donors and everything, which is, again, no one will be punished. There are no enemies. Yep. You're all good with us. Nothing will fundamentally change. Yep. Most importantly, not your quality of life. You won't have to stop buying yachts or certainly not swimming and you know pools. You won't of have caviar to release any of your slaves. You <laughs> the child zoo will remain open. Yes, the standard of the children in the child zoo will remain the same. Yes, they will be high quality, well fed. Yeah. They will be well fed and well taken well, care of. Course. They will have good child habitats <laughs> that are natural for them. Yes, they won't just be in cages. No, they'll I mean free the, the, illegal, the illegal immigrant ones. They'll be in well, cages course, for yes. sure. But, but the, the child zoo, they'll be able to run around. Have a nice, have a pool. Well, you can't let the meat can't get stringy. Is the thing that's <laughs> right. what happens when they're so, too tightly encased. I just, like I said before, before I leave Biden, I just like uh, Nando found these two clips of when Biden, I guess, was um, 
more lucid than he is now. This is when he was still sharp. And I just really want to play um, Joe Biden on raves because he's got a he, folks. He's got a problem with them. So this is a uh, Joe Biden. I would be passing new ordinances relating to stiff criminal penalties for anyone who held a rave. The promoter, the guy who owned the building. I would put the son of a gun in jail. <laughs> I would change the law. There's no doubt about where these raves are. In the middle of the desert. Arrest the promoter. Find a rationale unrelated to drugs. Keeping an unsafe for example. I'm the guy who authored the crack house legislation. We can use the crack house legislation to tear down these buildings. These buildings in the desert. He he wants to see a perp walk with a guy holding glow sticks and a cat in the hat hat. Like, that's what he wants more yeah. than anything. Mug shots with guys with pacifiers in their mouth. Wait, just one, one more clip of Joe Biden talking about, about raves. Cameron, in rare cases, under the law that exists federally, you can literally bulldoze down their business. I'm looking forward to the first time I see it happen. Great big bulldozer. Just bulldoze it down. Literally. Not figurative. Doesn't he know those <laughs> warehouses are the last vestiges of American manufacturing left in I'm this country? That he got like he got denied entry to a club somewhere. That's the only thing they could explain. He got turned away level. from Bergen. Yeah, he got turned uh, away from Bergen. How can just you like have we this did. much vi- just vituperative hatred for just a bunch of people like staring at their hands while listening to to drum and bass? Not I don't only understand that, this. Uh, Virgil reminded me of this. Like in addition, like in that clip, you hear Joe Biden say. I authored the crack house legislation. We, I made it illegal for the police to just raise <laughs> buildings with people inside of them if they're selling drugs. No, in addition to all of Joe Biden's other horrendous, you know, hyper acceleration of the war on drugs, even past what Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush wanted to do. So, at, you know, after crack uh, ceased to be, you know, a, a terror for middle class families in America, a few kids died of ecstasy overdoses. And, you know, Joe was back at it with this rave bullshit. And Virgil actually reminded me that part of one of these rave acts that he passed, and again, you heard his own voice. He said, charge the promoters. Make up something unrelated to drugs. Just charge them. (laughs) (laughs) Throw pacifiers on the ground. Well, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Doesn't this guy not realize that if funky beats are outlawed, only outlaws will have funky beats? (laughs) (laughs) Here's how anti-funky beats this rave act that Joe Biden had his fucking filthy fingers in was, that if you ran a party in which you did any harm mitigation to deal with right, someone yeah, who maybe yeah. uh, OD or like testing or, or testing make sure it's pure. or, or yeah, make yeah. sure it's, it's it's not poison or whatever that then you would be held liable for the selling of drugs in that thing and you would be they would throw the fucking book at you yeah. you could get hit with like you know just fucking, the smartest possible approach yeah to drug exactly policy. like anything that might per- actually prevent people from ODing on drugs which is what you know all these you know fucking middle class parents if are you also put them afraid in jail of. no one will do them anymore that's just how it works we know that by now. Yeah, that's Joe Biden. And I'd just like to point this out, though. I bring up the, the rave stuff. Again, thanks to Nando for uh, sourcing these. It just in stark contrast to our girl, Marianne. Yes. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, she wakes up every day, goes to a sober rave. Doesn't yeah. need drugs, but she is pro-funky she high on right. She's high on life. Orbs. The orbs are pulsating positive energy. Joe Biden is like, if Joe Biden sees an orb, he's like, bulldoze it. Yeah. Shoot He's it immediately. Basically, imagine it like uh, like Marianne is in her in her sober life. That's like sort of Smurf Village, and Biden is Gargamel, just trying to destroy all the pleasant fun that all of the communally mind community minded Smurfs are having. Just, I guess, my last thought on on Joseph R. Robinette Biden. Again, it's like early. It seems like he's leading some polls. I mean, who the fuck knows what's going to happen? Like I said, I, I have to must exit from making confident predictions about anything that's yeah. going to happen. But it is so hard for me. Like he, this guy has been on the wrong side of, of, liter- of literally thing. every issue yeah. that matters to every single <laughs> constituency that makes up the Democratic primary voting electorate. Yeah. It is. It's just. It's inconceivable Means testing, to me. Cutting. Cutting entitlements. War on drugs, mass incarceration, war in Iraq, uh, everything. I mean, the only thing he's got going for him is that we put it on stage when we were on Dublin, that pathetic friendship bracelet with Barack Obama, where he's just like, hey, I'm, I'm the guy you like, I'm friends with him. I'm, BB, I'm BFFs. 
And I don't know. I mean, like, I guess if you if you want to take this guy down, I mean, go at fucking Obama's record too. Mm. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I it's hard for me to say. What, either the thing is, uh, yeah, that, I, it's hard for me. That's to, the thing about primary Democratic primary voters is that they love Obama. And we, wa- I watched all of the second the Harris Biden Booker debate, and like I. I was just screaming at the TV the whole time. And then I woke up the next morning to read like the media rundowns of like their analysis of, you know, who won the debate. Now, folks, I don't use this term lightly, but when I say I've never felt more gaslit in my life, (laughs) like this is really what that means. Because I watched that debate and I was like, Joe Biden is as senile as Donald Trump. Oh, absolutely. He was a, a doddering, stuttering mess the entire debate. He couldn't get a fucking word out. Yeah. He kept like cutting himself off and saying things like, anyway. <laughs> um, and, then I, and then I read the rundown and every single pundit used the words strong and energetic to yeah, describe yeah. Biden's debate potency. appearance. And I'm like, this is gaslighting. They're, yeah. they're, we all watch the same fucking thing. I know everyone uh, glommed onto the thing where he was like, I, I, listen, I want you to visit Joe, Joe backslash dot 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 Biden dot co biz thirty twenty. No, it would have made more sense if he'd done that. He just listed numbers. <laughs> he said, "Go to Joe three zero eight eight. And that was he, like he was listening to Suicide Hotline. He was raising awareness, <laughs> and you guys are making fun of it. <laughs> Joe Biden looked. He looked young. He looked energetic. He looked with it when he uh, when he turned to uh, Pete Buttigieg and said, "Oh, honey." bringing all that and uh you got a pickle and a spear huh <laughs> you're uh you got all that and the chips come with you too honey all right have a great day he looked ready to lead he showed like the, he's the opposite of donald trump you know as far as just executive experience and like grace when he turned to every single woman at the audience at once and said hey honey uh so i didn't know they still uh they still had parades for gals like you huh <laughs> And no one knew what the fuck he was talking about, and it was awesome. It was everything. God, um, I just part of me really does want to see him get the nomination, just to see those debates between these two sundowning grandpas bouncing off of each other like they escaped from a rest home. And we're all supposed to watch it, be like, "Yeah, this this society is going to exist in twenty years for sure." Joe Biden is going to destroy Donald Trump when like his cataracts confuse him for like. Uh, Becky Quick or whoever the fuck is on CNN at the <laughs> first debates and he just kisses Donald Trump on the forehead <laughs> and rubs the small of his back and goes all right, all right sweetheart uh, you got a limit on 10 broken hearts tonight all right <laughs> and Donald Trump walks away confused and he's like you know go just fucking goes in on Condé Nast media properties <laughs> and then Joe Biden takes off his shirt and says you you fancy yourself a tough tough guy? Let's do some push ups, okay? <laughs> and then they just both fall down on the floor because they both pulled their backs. And that's like this is the most pivotal election of our lives when that happens. And then they both Donald Trump talks about how he stopped a mass shooter in Central Park in nineteen seventy two by getting out of his limo and throwing his briefcase at him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's you know that's you know, hey, that's not good stuff. And Joe Biden uh, says that there was a similar situation where uh, a guy tried to mass shoot the only building in Delaware, and Joe Biden threw a softball at him. <laughs> it was, it actually did a baseball-style fa- change-up. So the shooter thought it was coming at him slowly, and then it just knocked him out. And then he goes, and there was a hot dog stand there, too. And you know what? Yeah, uh, you kids today, you put avocados and all that stuff in the hot dog, but oh, boy, back then, you just needed your mustard and your ketchup. And a, uh, and a beautiful girl with you, my. So we won't talk about that. All right, sweetheart, sweetheart, sweetheart in the sweetheart in the front row. Wow, you got a uh, the bow. Did you come with the bow still on, sweetie? All right, great. And that is that's the that's the I'm donating. I'm maxing out to both of those candidates because I think Trump and Biden spend uh, twenty minutes during the first debate talking about whether it's okay to put ketchup on a hot dog. <laughs> 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 but no, we were talking about this last night. Like, if it's Biden and Trump in the general, those debates will have to be held before one o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> yes. Like before, like right before their nap, and like before their like blood the sugar of, crashes. In the middle of the debate, a nurse is going to come out and give them their medication. Will everyone before these debates commence? Will everyone rise for the Empire Carpets jingle? <laughs> played a max volume in the background of a phone call for some reason. And the phone call is about how to access your own email. 
they cut to Biden and he's eating out of a Jello cup. <laughs> they, they they have a twenty minute discussion about how to program a VCR. <laughs> I mean, he that's not even an exaggeration considering how much Trump loves to talk. About TiVo. <laughs> it's great. It's TiVo. You go beep, 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 and then you watch it faster. It's TiVo, folks. We love it. And then Biden's like, like ah, that TiVo, yeah, you got, that's pretty great. You get to rewind it. It's a, it's a miracle. So are you gals like in to, the audience, I'd like to maybe watch you on slow-mo. Just kidding. <laughs> I'd like to imagine uh, Trump TiVo's all his programs, but does it so that he can like Rewatch the commercials. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't fast forward through them. He like he rewinds them, and he's like, "I can't believe the the sprint guy switched. Very unfair, <laughs> treacherous. You know, what? it's the beautiful general, the auto insurance general. <laughs> you know, he's what? like, from a look at how strong he is. He's so handsome. Look, Central casting general, look at him. Shaquille so, O'Neal, that's a big guy. <laughs> 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 he's big. Guy. Some of, these, some, of these, guy, you think? <laughs> some of these generals even, you know, volunteer the time outside of the army to help people get auto insurance. <laughs> I, uh, the, you know what Trump tweet I love because it shows that he was senile like fucking seven years ago is the one where he's like, who's paying for this tedious Smokey Bear commercial? <laughs> <laughs> Enough of this. <laughs> Like, I think it's such I think it's the only time in his life he has used the word tedious. <laughs> <laughs> was I was Smokey the Bear. Who did he hear that from? <laughs> That's like like who did he talk to that said tedious yeah. and he actually used it correctly? <laughs> yeah, no. Somebody said it to him twenty minutes before that and it just stuck in his head and he just by accident used it correctly. Yeah. But like that was he great. actually thought it meant great. He's like, this is a tedious <laughs> smoking the bear ad. It's yeah. amazing. But like the that one's so good because it's like such Trump brand like he doesn't think it's like the forest preserve like the EPA or whatever paying for it to be like, hey, don't you know start forest fires. He's like Whose agenda is being served by this <laughs> awful bear? <laughs> and <laughs> also, the, it's a tedious commercial, implying that there are non-tedious commercials. <laughs> and it's like, no, the rest of these commercials are fantastic. Oh, my God, thrill rides. Uh, no, he I, absolutely has commercials he loves. Oh, yeah, no, no. He, he sings along with the 1877 Cars for Kids <laughs> ad every time he sees it. He yeah. claps his little hands together like a seal. Do you think that, like, the lawyers... He, he thinks the Cars for Kids commercial is, is a company that sells automobiles to children. <laughs> 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 they made, Timmy made a tremendous deal Do you think this car. He, like, he accidentally got the lawyers he did for the Mueller investigation because he just, like, subconsciously picked guys who looked like Salino and Barnes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best lawyers. I'd like to imagine uh, uh, Trump um, addressing, you know, the next spate of mass shootings and saying that we need to, we need to combat this by bringing back McGruff, the crime dog. <laughs> <laughs> he probably has a some bite out of crime. McGruff. No, you're right. McGruff was probably very, very rude to him yeah. at one point. <laughs> if you don't like Smokey, you probably fucking hate McGruff. <laughs> He's against all anthropomorphic animals. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're 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 a dog wearing a trench coat. You think you're better than me? <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese's last album was a flop. <laughs> Okay, you're right. Uh, no one wants to listen, Charles. Go home, sweetie. Bye bye. You very nasty. You're right. I think he does. He does hate uh, Matt, like you. He hates tunes of any kind. He hates anthropomorphized animals telling him to do anything. So I think Trump, to to counter the violence among America's youth, he should back a PSA ads where his friends in the mafia tell him, tell children how bad guns are. Yeah. These are some rough guys. Was, they say it's no good unless they owe you money. That's the funniest shit ever. Like before he started The Apprentice, I've talked about it a billion fucking times. But when they're like. I didn't know about having a TV show because I often do deals with the mafia. <laughs> like he literally said that. <laughs> like, like, like in a newspaper, like the mafia comes into my office all the time and they don't like camera. Like it's, it's so cool because like you go back to like, yeah, Obama and like, yeah, he shouldn't have like gotten that house from Tony Resco, but that's everyone in Chicago does that. I bought a house from Tony Resco. <laughs> my mom did and pretty like everyone. Everyone does it. It's fine. Jeremy Piven. Jeremy Piven. Well, OK, let's leave him out of this. But, uh, you know, but then you have like the next guy who's just like in an in interview with like, you know, one of those places that would interview Trump in like 2005, like GQ or something. He's like, I'm friends with the mob. 
<laughs> and it's just like, yeah, it's that doesn't matter, or it's like part of some 12D chess. Yeah, though, but uh, 